And so I sure thankful for that. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody? All right. We have about 10 minutes. Let me see if I can get through this as quick as we can. <laughs> the marriage of the Lamb. We've been talking in uh, our Bibles and the past couple of Sunday nights, we've been talking about the end times. We've covered the rapture. We understand that the rapture is the next thing that can take place on God's prophetic timetable. Nothing has to happen to keep that from happening. And at the rapture, we understand this, that in our studies, that Jesus does not come back to this world, but we meet him in the air at the rapture. At the rapture, at the trumpet, when it sounds, all of us that are saved, all right, even those that have already passed on, they know Christ will be raptured to be with him for eternity from that point on. Believers will be with Jesus at that point at the rapture from then all the way through eternity. We'll be with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We talked about the judgment seat of Christ. That is what will be happening in heaven. At the same time, the tribulation will begin here on the earth. And so we studied about the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ is where believers will have to go, and where believers will stand. And again, please remember this. Believers will not be judged on your salvation at the judgment seat of Christ. That was taken care of at Calvary. Past, present, and future sins were all taken care of at Calvary. The judgment seat of Christ, what will be judged is that is where we will be rewarded with rewards on how and the deeds and the things that we did from the point of our salvation to either the rapture or us tasting physical death. We will either gain rewards or we will lose rewards according to the things that we did in our life here. Now again, remember what I shared with you, please remember this, it's very important that a lot of times outwardly we can do things and we can do things for Christ outwardly, but please remember this, God judges the heart. If the intent in the heart is not right, but yet we go out and we do something, I believe personally those works will be burned up and lost. Because God looks on the heart as well. You see what I'm saying? If we do it with the right spirit, if we do it in the right attitude, if we do it in a way that maybe we're not to promote ourselves or maybe that we're not trying to get the applause of the accolades of man, but we're doing it according to what God has us to do, there will be rewards given out at the judgment seat of Christ. And we talked about the five crowns last week that will be able to be received at the judgment seat of Christ only for us to turn around and put those at the feet of our Lord and Savior to rejoice in Him. Tonight, we want to figure out the next thing that happens after the judgment seat of Christ, and it's what the Bible very simply calls the marriage of the Lamb. And in the marriage of the Lamb, if you have your Bibles, if you would, go with me, and we'll go to Revelation chapter number 19. Revelation chapter number 19. While you're turning there, uh, here in the next couple of weeks, let me also remind you that there are several different judgments that we will see in the end times. So we've already looked at one, and one of the judgments is the judgment seat of Christ. The second judgment that we will look at in these upcoming Sunday nights is the judgment of the nations. The judgment of the nations, and these are the Gentile nations and how they treated the Jewish people during the tribulation. And then, of course, there will be the great white throne of judgment at the end of the revelation, and that is where sinners and those that are lost will be judged and cast into the lake of fire. So at the marriage of the Lamb, go to Revelation chapter 19, verse number 7, and we'll read down through verse number 9. In Revelation 19, verse number 7, the Bible says this, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready. The lamb's wife here that he's talking about, the bride, please understand, is the church. Okay? And so, as a matter of fact, if you go to Revelation 21 and look at verse number 9 with me, just a couple pages over. Revelation 21, 9, it says this. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride the Lamb's wife, that is the church, that's you and I, we are the bride of Christ, okay? And so as we continue on there, you look at verse number 8, back in Revelation 19, verse 8, he says about the church, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. 
Anytime you see a garment mentioned in the scriptures, as we see here, it is talking and it is speaking about a symbol of righteousness. So what it's talking about here is this, that we as the church, the bride of Christ, when it talks here and it says this, that we are going to be uh, arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of who? The saints. And continue to look at verse number 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, as we look at this and as we study this, I want to share with you that as we go through the Scriptures, especially in the New Testament, there's several passages in the New Testament, and I'll give you just a few of these, where, which present Christ in His church as the bridegroom and the bride. Go with me, if you would, to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. We want to look here at verse number 9. John chapter number 3, verse number 9. I'm sorry, John 3, 29. I'm sorry, I can't read my own writing. John chapter 3, verse number 29. This is the testimony of John the Baptist. And here in John chapter 3, verse number 29, listen to what John the Baptist says. He says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore is fulfilled so here even John the Baptist is sharing the relationship between Christ and his church as a bridegroom and his bride look with me if you would to Romans chapter number seven in Romans chapter number seven I want to look here and we'll look at the first four verses Romans chapter seven we want to look at the first four verses Paul's writing here And Paul, under the inspiration of God, says this, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Look at verse number 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, and that Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection stopped the law that we see here. And he says this, You become dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Paul here is even writing about the marriage between the church and Jesus Christ as the bride and the bridegroom. Now, go with me if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and here we want to look at verse number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 2. Paul here, again, is writing, and you look here and see what Paul says. He says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you as a bride to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Talking about the church, and again, Jesus being the bride and the bridegroom at the marriage of the Lamb. Now, go with me if you would, a very familiar passage, Ephesians chapter number 5. We'll look here at verses 23 through verses 32. This is a passage that is known where Paul is writing about the husband and the wife and their relationship. But also notice in this passage as well, he talks about Jesus and his relationship to the bride, which is the church. Ephesians chapter 5, and if you skip down with me to verse number 23. Verse 23, Paul writes, he says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject, or as as the church is under obedience unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I want to show you right here this little phrase, even as Christ also loved the church. I want you to see that Christ's love for the church is threefold. It's past, it's present, and it's future. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. For the love he gave himself to redeem the church, that is the past. Look at verse number 25, again where he says, Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. You see, for his love that he gave himself to redeem us. That's the past. The present, in his love, he is sanctifying the church. Look at verse number 26. That he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Talking about the church, that he may sanctify, make holy. And then in the future, it's for the reward of his sacrifice and labor of love, he will present the church to himself in flawless perfection, and we see that in verse number 27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy, pure, blameless, without blemish. Continue reading down verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and who? The church. The marriage of the Lamb. See, when Jesus comes in the rapture, he will appear as a bridegroom to take his bride into himself. And the relationship that is pledged between Christ and the church will be consummated. And as a husband and wife, it says there in verse 31, we and Christ, as the church and Christ, will become one at the marriage of the Lamb. And so this is what will be taking place at the end of the judgment seat while the tribulation is taking place here on the earth. So, what is the time of the marriage of the Lamb? Go back, if you would, to Revelation chapter number 19. Revelation chapter 19. We'll be done here in just a moment if you follow along real quick. Revelation 19, and we want to look at verses number 7 and verse number 8 again. So, what is the time of the marriage of the Lamb? Again, he says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. See, the scriptures here refer only to those things which have been accepted at the judgment seat of Christ. So the marriage must occur between the time when our works are judged and the time when the King of Kings will reign from the throne of David and the bride in the church will reign with him. So when is the time of the marriage of the Lamb? It will be in between the time after the judgment seat of Christ and before the second coming of Jesus is when the marriage of the Lamb will take place. And that will take place. And so we want to ask this question, and we'll be done. Where is the place of the marriage of the Lamb? Where will that take place? All right, if you've ever seen a young lady especially get married, you see she's usually very particular about where she wants to get married at. She wants it to be a very beautiful place, a very memorable place that she can remember. So I'm just sitting here asking myself this. I would think there's no memorable, no more beautiful place than heaven itself. But let's look here and let's see this. You want to understand as we read here, since this happens after the judgment seat, it will take place in heaven. Okay? The marriage of the Lamb will take place in heaven. And it's from heaven that the church will reign And not only reign, but we will return with Christ. Look at Revelation 19 with me real quickly in verse number 14. After the marriage of the Lamb, when you see that Jesus comes back, look at Revelation 19, verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Guess who this is? Anybody want to guess who this is? This is the church. This will be us following Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our Savior. You see, the marriage of the Lamb involves the true church. 
And it's made up of all blood-washed believers from the 120 that were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost up to and including the last person that will be born again before the rapture. All believers will take place in the marriage of the Lamb because we will make up and constitute the church. And so what we want to be able to see is that the rapture will take place. Next thing they can have will be the rapture. During the rapture, there will be two events happening after the rapture. We've looked at the, the events that will be taking place in heaven, which will be the judgment seat of Christ, where we are judged according to our life and how we lived in salvation, the things that we did for Christ, being rewarded for our works. And then after that, we see we go into the marriage of the Lamb, where we come together, the bride with the bridegroom, and we will reign with Him forever, being with Him for eternity, returning back with Him as we read there in Revelation 19, verse number 14, the whole time this is taking place, and this is where we'll pick up next week, the whole time this is taking place, the tribulation is happening here on earth. This is going to be very eye-opening to you and I who have studied it and you've read about it because when you read the tribulation, it will, if you truly are saved, it ought to put such an urgency in your heart and life to want to tell as many people about Jesus Christ because when you see what they're fixing to have to suffer through at the absence of Jesus Christ, and you see that in the absence of the believers in Jesus Christ. And to see what will be going on here on this earth. And hopefully it will be an urgency for you and I that each day God has given to us. And we are definitely being witnesses and telling people about our Lord and Savior and about His coming. All right. Our dear most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you tonight, Lord, for the testimonies that we've heard. And thank you. Father, for your love for us. I thank you for the word of God that is such a blessing and it's such an encouragement. Lord, have we heard several tonight who have shared different passages in the scriptures and what a blessing it's been to help us to continue on in our walk for you. Lord, we thank you for the word. Thank you for the privilege and the power that there is in prayer. Thank you for the precious time that we had together as believers in Christ tonight and being able to look at the future and what's going to happen and where we'll be, Father, after the rapture. And we'll be with you for an eternity. And Lord, we rejoice and praise you and thank you for that truth. Again, as we've been praying all day today, be with us as we go out this week. Help us to be a light for you. Keep us safe. We love you today, Father, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.